Welcome everyone to the fifth lecture in this series and um, Howdy. May Day. Hello. Oh. Um, what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to talk about the uh, relationship of braids to the symmetry group or the permutation group. So that is a very strong relationship. So remember how we did braids. So let's do a braid uh, here. Okay. Right. Indu. Roger, I think you, you should see this? mute everyone. There's a lot of background noise. Can anybody see this? Yeah. Of course, I can't hear anybody. Um, you should be able. To, um, you should be able to hear people. I hear background. Let me unmute you all. Let's stop sharing. So manage participants unmute all okay right now um let's try again so can you see this yes yes i can't hear anything because i haven't got the sound on okay can you hear it can you <laughs> can yes. you see it See and hear. Yeah, Nobody wants to talk. <laughs> um, but, oh. Can somebody tell me? We can hear and we can see. No problem. It's very soft. I don't know why. I can barely hear people. Can you tell me if you saw that braid picture? Yes. 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 Okay, good, yes. good. Okay. Right, we can start. Okay, so here's the picture again. And that's a braid on four strings. And as we know, we can make a knot diagram out of this by uh, joining up the ends. Okay, so um, let's um, annotate. I've lost it again now. Um, all right. Okay, so you all know this. If you join up the strings like this, you find a diagram of a knot, and it is a very special diagram because um, it is the closure of a braid, all right? So there we go. So there we've got a braid. Braid, <coughs> sorry, a braided diagram, and we know that every knot diagram can, by using the second Reitermeister move, it can be made into a braided diagram or the closure of a braid. Now, let's get rid of that and admit somebody in the waiting room. Now, supposing, um, supposing I do the following. Supposing I look at the relation. So <clears throat> what I should say is that this braid can be written as a word. Okay, so here, this is uh, sigma three. Uh, this is sigma one inverse, this is sigma 
2. This is sigma 3 inverse. And this is sigma 1. Okay. So that's represent that's that word represents that braid. Now supposing we decide to put all the sigmas so that their square is one. Okay, so if I can draw this and then that's squared. And supposing that's equal to one. Then that's the same as saying that sigma i inverse is the same as sigma i. So a positive, a positive crossing like this is just the same as a negative crossing like this. So um, in that case, uh, I could have a bigger, never mind, you can see what I'm doing. These just cross now, and I can't tell the difference between a positive crossing or a negative crossing. And if I number these uh, one, two, and so on, three, whoops, four, and then I trace these back. One goes back to four. Uh, two goes to two. And three goes to three. It therefore follows that four must go to one. Hang on, does that... Four... <laughs> Sorry, what I'm saying is if I trace back from here, I get a permutation of the numbers one to four. Four goes to one, uh, one goes to four, two goes to two, and three goes to three. So that's a permutation. And that's what happens when I put this relation, this quadratic relation here. Okay, so let's get rid of that and let's have a look i'm going to share again now and start the um let's have a look here so um So this is how, right. So I hope you can all see this. Is this correct? No, um, we well, we're seeing the file. list. What's that? File list. We're looking at your file list. Your file list. I can't hear you very well. I don't know why. Um, Roger, we only see the file, the list of like all the files. Oh, okay. Um, so you have to stop the share screen and then what start normally again. happens here is I have to stop sharing and then share again and then it somehow works. Um, can you see it now? Oh. Now we see you. Never mind. Let me see what I can do. Okay, so this is... The usual hiccups, of course, with this. So... Um, hmm. see this. Can you see now? Yes, we can. You can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Okay. So here's a little bit of chat. 
The theory of braids combines topology, algebra, geometry, and combinatorics in an interesting way. It also has connections with theoretical physics via the Yang-Baxter equation, well, and other ways as well. The braid group BM may be defined in several ways, but for this lecture, assume that BN on N strands is the group generated by sigma i, that's the crossing we, talk, we talked about, i equals 1 up to n minus 1, and these are the relations which we discussed in the last lecture. So sigma i commutes with sigma j if they're far enough apart, and if they're not, then you have this cubic relation here, sometimes called the Yang-Baxter equation. Okay, let's see what we've got next. Okay, now, if we add the relation sigma i squared to be the identity for all possible i, we get a, a representation of the symmetric group Sn on n symbols, one up to n. Every braid defines a permutation, let's call it pi of A, by the following rule. Supposing a strand of A has n point at level i, call this the i strand of A, let pi of A be the level of its initial point. Okay, then this map here is a homomorphism. <coughs> Hence, Sn is a quotient group of Bn. The map fits into a short exact sequence. So here we go, we go from Bn to Sn. The kernel is Pn, and this is called the pure braid group, and consists of those braids where the associated permutation of the initial points one to n is the identity. Okay, so that's <coughs> the pure braid group, which is a subgroup. Right, I'm going to talk about the word problem in the braid group. So this lecture is going to be fairly algebraic and I make no apologies. The mathematics is quite beautiful. So the word problem in BM may be solved by several different ways. In this lecture, we will present the R-side solutions of the word problem. That's a, a reference, which is unnecessary. His method is particularly interesting since it also solves the conjugacy problem in BM. The method relies on the fact that the monoid of positive braids embeds in the braid group. We therefore start with some remarks on monoids. So what is a monoid? Well, it's a pre-group, so it's, it's a set with an associative multiplication possessing a unit. To any monoid M, we can assign a group G of M called the groupification of M. I'm not sure if that's an English word in the dictionary, but it's what we do, we invent words, okay. Which loosely speaking is defined by making each element of the monoid invertible and seeing what happens. Now a monoid M embeds in a group if and only if the canonical map which embeds, well, sorry, is the, um, is the map from M to GM just by saying you go, you've got M and now you suddenly say, oh, we're going to invert every element or every element's gonna have an inverse. And if that is an embedding, then that's what we, we know that M does embed in a group, okay? And I think I've mentioned earlier that we do not know if any particular monoid embeds in its groupification. Some do, while others do not. A necessary condition for a monoid to embed in a group is that it has a two-sided cancellation. Okay, this means that if I've got ABD is ACD, this implies that AB equals AC and BD equals CD. Surprisingly, perhaps, this condition is not sufficient as an example of Malchev shows. We'll give this example later on, having introduced the notion of monoid presentations. Okay, 
So what is a monoid presentation? We've got a set A. If we put square brackets round, we'll say that's the free monoid on A. That's the set of all words in A with concatenation as multiplication. So a monoid presentation, AR, consists of a set A and a subset of the product, the square. For UV belong to R, we often write U equals V, okay? So what's a monoid move? It's the replacement of a subword U of a word W by the subword V, okay? So that seems pretty obvious. The monoid devoted by AR is the quotient monoid of A, where the two words in A are equivalent, if and only if they can be obtained one from the other by a finite sequence of monoid moves. Okay. Now, dare I stop sharing for now, um, so I can see your happy faces. Um, so raise your hands if you could see all that. Was that okay? Yeah, good, excellent, okay. So let's go back to sharing. Um, uh, <coughs> raise your hand if you can see that. Yep. I see you. You can? Seeing you. Yep. Right. So let's consider three different kinds of equalities. We will write W1 is equal to W2. These are words, okay, in this alphabet A. We, we see W1. your face, not your You can't your see page. it? No, what? Roger, we can't see the screen. Can you not see it? No, there is uh, not, you didn't start the Okay, let me try yet. again. Um. Can you see that? Uh, no, I'm sorry. No. You can't? No, it's, I'm sorry. Unfortunately okay, not. not to worry. Um. Something is happening now. Uh, we see the file now, the, like the file list. Can you see it now? Yeah, but it's just file the folder. List. Sorry? File, fi we see the file list, but not... But not the... No. Nah. Knew I shouldn't have stopped sharing. <laughs> oh Do you need... Can you see Do it you need to switch screens? Roger, I think you need to stop sharing again and then start over. We only see the file list. You can still only see the file list. Yeah, so you, you have to like start sharing all over again. Okay. It works now. 
Could you see it now? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks. I was just saying thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know why it's so. Um, speak again. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay. Right, so we've got three different types of equality. We can write W1 equals W2 if they are equal as words. Okay, and W1 is equal up to the monoid if they are equal in the monoid. Okay, after we've done some changes. And then we've got W1 is equal in the group if they are equal in the groupification. With this notation we get, okay, let W1, W2 be two words. Then W1 is equal in the group to W2 if and only if they can be related by a sequence of monoid moves and insertions or deletions of the pair A, A inverse or A inverse A where A is in the alphabet, okay. Right, now. So, we've introduced the notion of monoid presentations. We can now give Malchev's example. Okay, um, well, you might want to consider this later. You've got it, it'll be on the recording. So uh, apparently this monoid has two-sided cancellations. However, it does not embed in a group because this is true in the group, but it's not true in the monoid. And you might like to prove that or as an exercise. Okay, so just that's just really to show that um, it's, it's not necessarily true that the, the monoid of, of um, positive, we're, we're going to look at the, the monoid of positive uh, braids. Well, when I say positive, we are really talking about um, just the sigma i's and no inverse. So if you look at the group presentation of Bn, it's this presentation could also be considered as a monoid presentation because there are no appearances of the inverse. So the corresponding monoid will be called the monoid of positive braids and will be denoted by Bn plus. Now, when I say positive here, some people have different definitions of positive, but this is what we'll call positive for now, okay. Notice that the word length is an invariant of positive braids because all the relations in Bn are homogeneous in the word length. Since there is only a, there's only a finite number of words with a given word length, the word problem in Bn plus is solvable. And this monoid does embed in its groupification Bn. And now we're going to prove that. Okay. Right, remember we had a homomorphism from uh, Bn to Sn defined by tracking back the strands. Next, we will define permutation braids, which form a subset of Bn plus. Okay. So a permutation braid B is an element in Bn plus such that for some diagram of B, each pair of strands crosses yes. at most once. Right. The set of permutation braids right. in BN so will be noted by SN. Yes, because I don't have access to any experimental data. There's chatting so going on. Can you see? So, so they are simulated data, and because they are simulated, I know. <laughs> because. Um, so, what, uh, I we can hear you. You can hear me. No, yeah, we can also hear you, but it's Robert. We can hear. Robert. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. 
And I can just about hear you. I don't know why it's so quiet. But anyway. So let's continue. So as I said, a permutation braid is an element on BN plus such that for some diagram B, each pair of strands crosses at most once. So that's uh, the set of permutation braids in BN plus will be noted, be denoted by SN dashed. We will see that SN and SN dashed are in bijective correspondence by associating to each element of SN a unique word in SN dashed. Now, note that SN dashed is not a subgroup for a submonoid of BN plus. Okay. So now, what do we do here now? Um, okay. We look at the set R pi of reversals. So R pi is all those pairs ij, such that the sign of i minus j is the opposite sign to pi i and pi j. A gift from Zoom. We're not running out of time. Okay, <clears throat> so ij is in this set of reversals if and only if the i th and the j th strand of pi cross. Okay, and otherwise they don't cross. So the for permutation permutation braid, the strings either cross or they don't. And they, if they cross, they cross once. Okay. Now the permutation pi is completely determined by the set of reversals and determines a unique word in the generators as follows. Take ij in r pi for which pi i minus pi j is minimal. And then a moment's thought will convince you that the difference between pi i and pi j is one. Uh, obviously, i is not equal to j, because then it wouldn't be in here. So this definitely is positive. Let's suppose that pi i is k, which is less than pi j. Then we can take a factor on the left of sn dashed of the form sigma k. This reduces the number of elements in r pi, and by induction we are done. Okay, so that's, that's how we prove that. Now the word length of a braid A in terms of the standard generation of sigma is the smallest R such that A can be written in terms of R generators. And it's an easy exercise to check that for a permutation braid, the length is the number of reversals divided by two. Now, the description of permutation braids by their set of reversals may be used to define a partial order on the set SN of permutation braids. So if we've got two elements of SN dashed, two permutation braids, we say that sigma is less than or equal to pi if and only if the set of reversals of sigma is contained within the set of reversals of pi. And this partial ordering has a minimal and a maximal element. Obviously, the minimal element is just the identity in BN when the set of reversals is empty set. By tradition, the maximal element of SN dashed is denoted by capital delta. It's completely determined by its action on one up to N. As a permutation, it is given by taking i and reflecting in the central horizontal line, okay? So, and as a braid, it can be written in terms of the standard generators in the following way, okay? The reader may check that the length of delta is n times n plus one divided by two. Number of ways of choosing two things from n. 
Okay, to find a group homomorphism from Bn to Bn, B goes to B star by setting sigma i star equals sigma m minus i on generators. So we can see that for any B belonging to Bn, we have that delta times B is B star times delta. Delta is like a full twist through 180 degrees. Half twist. And in a positive way. And so that reflects or turns around the, um, yeah. <clears throat> the braid through the central um, symmetry line, horizontal symmetry line, okay? Right, so, and um, as easy consequences is that delta squared is in the center of Bn. In fact, the center of Bn is infinite cyclic and is generated by delta squared. Right. Supposing we, two, we have two permutation braids, sigma and pi. If sigma is less than pi, then there exists a sigma dashed in Sn such that pi equals sigma sigma dashed. Okay, we can complete sigma to make it to be pi, and the length of pi is the length of sigma plus the length of sigma dashed. <clears throat> and if we replace pi by delta, then there's a unique right factor, sigma r, and a unique left factor, sigma l, such that sigma times sigma r, the right factor is delta, and that is sigma l times sigma, okay? To complete it, to make it into this, this braid here, <coughs> delta. Right, we are now in a position to define the right greedy form of a positive braid. It is clear that any positive braid can be written as a product of permutation braids. Now take a diagram of a positive braid B. Look for the longest right factor of B, which is a permutation braid, and call it P1. So, okay, so that's a factor of B. And inductively, we carry on. We can write B as PK, PK minus 1 up to P1 where all the PI are permutation braids and where PJ is the longest right factor of PK up to PJ, which is a permutation braid. This decomposition is the right greedy form of B. Um, we can also define the left greedy form because we're not biased, okay? So here's an example, the right greedy form of this positive braid is p1, p2, p3, where p3 is that, p2 is that. So that's a little exercise for you to check that that's the case. Right. So we still haven't proved that Bn plus embeds in Bn. But anyway, a monoid M is said to be reversible if for any uv in M there exists an xy in M such that u times x is v times y. Now this is a generalization of commutativity since any commutative monoid is reversible. You see, if I put x equal to v and y equal to u, then I've got uv equals vu, okay, because it's commutative. So this is, this is a kind of generalization of commutativity. The notion of reversibility becomes important by the following theorem due to Orr. So Orr's theorem. A reversible monoid with two-sided cancellation embeds in a group. Well, I invite you, those of you who've done a, a course on ring theory, to prove this theorem. It's um, what you do is you define the group of fractions which you construct in the usual way. You look at pairs of um, monoids where, say, um, monoid elements where uv, say, u comma v, and you want v to be non-zero. And then 
we imagine that they are fractions and we multiply them and add them in the usual way. And um, we get, um, we get a, a, a sort of field, well, not a field, but a, um, an integer domain. And anyway, that proves that this reversible monoid with two-sided cancellation embeds in the group. So you need the two-sided cancellation as well as the reversibility. <clears throat> well, now we'll prove that BM plus embeds in BM by showing that BM plus satisfy the conditions of Bohr's theorem, okay? So let's prove that the monoid BM plus is reversible. So we take two, arbitrary braids, um, well, actually BM plus, there should be a plus there. Let me put that in, um, come on. I can't seem to, yeah, here we are, annotate. So, um, <clears throat> so that's um, two arbitrary positive braids, okay? So let U be P1 to PK, so that's the right greedy form of U with PI in SN, I should say SN dashed, of course, anyway. For all PI, there exists a permutation braid QI with PI QI equals this, okay? So by induction on K, we see that there exists a positive braid Q tilde with UQ tilde equals um, the kth power of delta. Similarly, there is a Q dash tilde with VQ dash equals uh, delta L, um, where I haven't, I should have said that V has length L, I suppose. Anyway, so we've got that U Q tilde delta L is the same as V Q dash delta delta K Q dash, which proves the proposition. Hence, we've shown that the first assumption of Orr's theorem holds for BN plus. And the second assumption is easily deduced uh, come on, clear. <clears throat> By first checking it for permutation braids and then for all positive braids. Okay, so the monoid BM plus has two sided cancellation, and we get that the monoid BM plus embeds in the group BM. In fact, Garside has shown an even stronger result. Any braid B belonging to BM can be written in the form B is a is some power of delta times B dashed with M is um, an integer and B, dash, B dashed is a positive braid. With a little bit of care, we can make them unique. Since the word problem in BM plus is solvable, Garside's result sort of solves the word problem in BM. Okay, so that's the important thing about um, BN and its relationship with SM. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk about some representations of the braid group. And the first one I want to talk about is the Burau representation. So I take this matrix here, two by two matrix, and T is some uh, some element, some invertible element in, so in this, the, <coughs> excuse me, in this ring here, integer coefficients and, um, and uh, powers of t, possibly negative. Okay, so Laurent, Laurent polynomials, if you like. Mm. As in the case of BM, we get natural inclusions, M2 and M3 and so on, given by 
um, taking a matrix, putting it into a bigger matrix with the identity here. And then there's a shift homomorphism from M to M. This is the infinite, um, infinite uh, matrices just by pushing A down a bit and putting one naught, naught, naught. And then we define sigma I by sigma I is the shift of sigma I minus one. And so the Bura representation is given by beta of sigma I is capital sigma I. Okay, so we associate with every, every generator um, this uh, matrix. And the, uh, and of course, once we've got the generators in deter determine, which determine a matrix, every element becomes determined becomes a matrix. So it, it's what's called a linear representation. Now, <clears throat> I may not be up to date with all of this, but uh, so you might have to tell me if I've got this wrong. Um, the question as to whether the Burau representation is faithful or not was an open question or an open problem until the early 90s. That's the uh, 1990s, when John Moody came up with a non-trivial braid, which is mapped to the identity matrix by the Bureau representation. His first example was a braid on n strands. An easier example on six strands was given later. Note, however, that the Bureau representation of Bn is faithful for n less than four. And as far as I know, the cases B4 and B5 remain open. But if I'm wrong about that, you'll have to tell me. Now, why have I mentioned the Burau representation? Because it leads to the Alexander polynomial. You probably guessed that because when you saw the T coming up. So <clears throat> when we close a braid, the Burau representation, we look at the eigenvalues and that will give us the Alexander polynomial but we have bigger fish to fry, okay? And now I'm not going to go on much longer because you're probably reeling from all this algebra, but the next thing I'll talk about next week, we're looking at representations of the Bray groups into Hecker algebras. These representations lead to the definition of the Jones polynomial polynomial and the Hompf-like polynomial of knots. So we said if we put sigma i squared equals one, we get the permutation group. This is a quadratic relation, so let's try something like this. Sigma i squared is p times sigma i plus q. So now we're mapping it, uh, we're quotient, quotient it by this example, by this relation, and we're going to get a ring. So this turns Bn into a ring, and if we write this relation as, so let's multiply on both sides on the right by sigma i inverse, we get sigma i is p plus q sigma i to the minus one. So let me do a little drawing here. Um, uh, Yeah, okay. So sigma i goes like this. Because it's positive. P, well, this is just the identity. Or it's P times the identity. And this is Q times the inverse, which goes like this. So you see, we've got a skein relation. So the skein relation is like a quadratic relation on the braids. And um, we, want to, we want to make that into a homomorphism. Oh, let's get rid of that. Clear all drawings. We want to make this map from sigma i to q into a homomorphism. And if, and if you do for, 
you do the algebra, you see that P is Q minus one. So um, we've got this um, Hecker algebra. So I'll say what the Hecker algebra is. So we've got Laurent polynomials in Q, the Hecker algebra HN is the algebra generated by one, T1 up to TN minus one with these relations. So TI and TJ commute if they're far enough apart. And you have this cubic relation here uh, for when they're not far apart. And now TI squared is Q minus one times TI plus Q for every element of T. So this is the quadratic relation we got, okay? And so, so let's say here, the first two relations correspond to the relations in the Bray group. The last relation assures that the map given by TI going to Q is an A-algebra homomorphism. Moreover, it implies that TI inverse is given by this formula here, okay? Okay, that's, all I want to say now, because this will eventually lead to um, the Homflight polynomial uh, using this representation of the Bray group. And it's Friday evening, it's May Day, and um, too much algebra is bad for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll come back to that next week. Are there any questions? Scott. What's Q in terms of A in your uh, temporally leave relation? Q in terms of A in yeah. your temporally leave relations. The temporally leave? Yeah, Q in terms of lose A. Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> We'll look. We'll be looking at. We'll get a, a corresponding um, formula for the um, the uh, the skein relation, and that will tell you what it is. Okay. So the you'll have to be patient and wait for next week. Roger, could you give us the uh, the name of the book you were using for your lecture? Oh, they were just my notes. But I can put the notes online if you like. That would be that would be great. Yeah. Okay. The trouble is that the no, the notes I had, they were made by a student of mine, and uh, I've lost the pictures. <laughs> so um, that's why there were no pictures because I've lost them. I don't know where they've gone. Um, but um, I, I certainly put the, you'll, you'll have to pretend that, you'll have to make your own pictures, that's all I'm saying. Okay, but I can certainly put the text up. No problem. Are there any other questions? Roger, if you send me a copy of your notes, I will put them in the Dropbox that I'm using. Oh, good man. Okay, thanks, Lou. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I suggest if somebody actually does draw the pictures, that they also go with in the drop. Box. Right, who's going to volunteer to draw the pictures? <laughs> I, I draw pictures. <laughs> okay, well, I'll give them to Lou, and you can <clears throat> suck them out of Lou's. No, I don't um, think Lou is going to draw the pictures, but oh, we Lou have. Oh, going to draw the pictures. We have no. I say he isn't, but uh, oh, he isn't. There, there seems to be an army of people. We could assign one person yeah. one picture, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Right. Well, um, I will say good evening to all forty-two of you. Oh. Hello. Paul Martin has just arrived. It's a bit late. Paul, you missed the entire lecture, but not by much. <laughs> okay. Enjoy Thanks, the rest of your day or evening or whatever. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Roger. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank Roger, you. Roger, I like your shirt. Where did you get that? Oh, it's Indonesian. <laughs>
Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment on my shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good night. Good night. Thank good night. you again. Good night. <laughs>